My name is Ryan Olivarius. I'm the MC along with uh, Maddie. Uh, we're gonna kick off the we're gonna kick off this ice gathering clean energy and climate action conversation circle. This conversation circle will dwell into how climate action needs to respect indigenous rights and to be inclusive in, of indigenous leadership. Conversation participants might highlight major emergent opportunities for further indigenous clean energy climate action, such as energy efficiency and housing, bioenergy and sustainable transport. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Melina Labakan Massimo, Sacred Earth Solar. She's gonna be our moderator for today. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Tanteguakia, Nia Melina Miawapin Labakan Massimo, Nia Nikiao, Kinas Kuntanawao. It is an honor and privilege to be with you all today virtually. Um, and it's an honor and privilege to be with all of the people on this panel who I have so much respect for, what we would call the OGs of clean energy. Um, so, so happy to hear just different perspectives and different um, backgrounds and life experiences. Um, we're gonna have a round of questioning um, to each panelist. And today I am joined with Kim Scott, who is from the Kishk Anokwit Health Center, Health Research Center, or Health Research, actually. Kim, I'm so sorry that I butchered that because I even asked you to do it better, but my apologies. <laughs> um, I need to take initial um, lessons, language lessons, obviously, but Cree speaker, so I'm, I'm going to use that as my excuse. Um, so, and Ian Skolton, um, Indigenous Clean Energy, Judith Sayers, Neutron Tribal Council, Chris Henderson with the Indigenous Clean Energy, Richard Fl Florizone, International Institute for Sustainable Development, and Kathy Bardswick with the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. So as you can see, we are joined with a vast array of experience and knowledge. So I'm going to just dive right into the conversation we are going to today cover. This is a conversation that will delve into how climate action needs to respect indigenous rights and be inclusive of indigenous leadership. And so this is the conversation we're going to be having as an amazing wrap up plenary, um, closing plenary for the amazing gathering that happened this week that indigenous clean energy um, put on the whole week um, clean uh, around clean energy and climate action. So I'm going to just delve right into these into this the first question here. And the first question is, I would like to ask each panelist if you would be open to sharing your personal motivations that empowers you to devote your talents, time and powers to address the global and local challenges of climate, climate change. And I'm going to ask um, Kim if you're okay with starting. Thank you, Melina. Whoops. Kim, you're on mute right now. Okay. Thank you, Melina. I'm drawn to this conversation because I understand the power of words. Um, if we pay close attention, there are many, many conversations in Canada about Indigenous clients, patients, and inmates. This is a conversation about Indigenous agency, industry, and leadership. And so that's my personal motivation to be a part of this because culture lives in language. And this is a good news story about climate leadership where Indigenous peoples are leading well ahead of Canadian municipalities. And it needs to be shared at every kitchen table, at every, with every barista, with every cabbie, with every Canadian. This is how we change our status in Canada. So that's my personal motivation. Thank you, Kim. And we'll move on to Ian. We're just going in alphabetical order here in the reverse. Thanks, Melina. I always have a hard time following Kim up. She's such a such a deep speaker. Um, very to the point. But uh, for me, I mean, I was I went for a walk the other day and I was looking at downtown Vancouver and then I would look out at the mountains and I would think, oh, my God, there is so much work to be done here. Um, when we think about climate change and the things that are going on and sometimes can feel really, really challenging to like get up in the morning and keep fighting that fight to, to make change. Um, but then I think about this story called the flight of the hummingbird. It's, I think it's a, a Peruvian, I think Quechan is the, the indigenous community on there that this story originates from, but it's about a hummingbird 
um, just trying to fight a fire, doing the little bit that he can, picking up a little bit of water and dropping it on the flames. Um, and so I, I remind myself of that, that, you know, it's every little bit counts. Um, and then I think about the 2020 Catalyst program and the community that we have at ICE. And that's, I, I brought, I would, know, I would have brought the, dr the drum that we give out as part of the 2020 program, but unfortunately I don't have it with me. So I, I printed off this picture, which that's the best I could do today. Um, but I think about that and I think about how, you know, that hummingbirds dropping that little beat and, you know, each individual person beating on that drum. And when we have this whole community now beating the drums together, that's a really loud noise. And so that's, that's what keeps me going. It's not, not what's internal, but is this community, is, is everyone and all the stories that you heard this week of people working to make change and just being able to contribute to that. And, and to work alongside those people. Thank you, Ian. I'll pass it over to Judith Sayers of the New Chamless Tribal Council, who I have so much respect for, and she's one of the first women I heard about that worked on clean energy many years ago when I started my journey. And so I really look up to you, Judith, so thank you for joining us, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Melina. And greetings from the Hoopachesset Territory located on the west coast of Vancouver Island. I am very pleased um, to join you today and to hear different aspects of what you've been talking about all week. Uh, what motivates me is the beautiful Hoopachesset Territory that I just told you about and maintaining it. You know, throughout my short um, life, um, in, in the scheme of things, although Melina was calling us OGs, I'm not sure if that's old guys. <laughs> we, um, <clears throat> you know, there's been many, many uh, climate change just watching it. And it, it concerns me and it drives me to ensure that I will be able to say to my grandchildren, yes, we can still fish. Yes, there are still orcas in the water. Yes, we still have old growth forests. And, you know, it's that effort to maintain what we have that drives me. And that's rooted in our values as New Chama people, that it is our responsibility, it's our duty, it's our stewardship that we have to follow. And, you know, I would not be doing my ancestors any justice if I was to ignore what's right in front of me. And, you know, it's also just being a role model for my children and other children, and other people that we all need to open our eyes. We need to act yesterday and we need to let everybody in this world know that. And so what motivates me is trying to be that voice that we can join in and save this planet, save our lives. And we got this pandemic of COVID and they say there's worse ones coming and climate change is that. So our very lives depend on this, you know, whether it's just in warming temperatures or in our own health. So there's many things that motivate me, but you know, I, it's been my life work and I really enjoy working with people like all of you who have commitments for various reasons. So thank you, Melina. Hi, thank you, Judith. Just some, um, it actually means original gangsters. Um, <laughs> um, just translating between the, the younger crowd and the older crowd, and I'm going to pass it to another OG, Chris Henderson, who I have a lot of respect for as well, so I'll pass it to you, Chris. Thanks very much, Malia. <clears throat> you know, um, this, is, this is pretty deep for me. Um, uh, my motivation is, is in, in, intentionally personal and intentional about the change we have to affect. The first time I did work on climate change was in 1988, almost over 30 years. And my motivation is this, this hockey puck, because this is about where the puck is going, as Wayne Gretzky used to say, we have to get to the going, we have to go to. But if I look that way, two blocks that way, is the outdoor hockey rink that I grew up with my sons, Isaac and Noah. And so my motivation is completely intentional that we need to make sure that for generations of the future, if we are, we are future ancestors, we have to ensure that we take action to leave the planet in better than we received it and we're not on the path we need to. 
So that can motivate me in deep ways. It gives me determination. It gives me power. It gives me the ability to get over the challenges we face, and we need all of us to do that. So that's my motivation, this hockey puck. And uh, I'm delighted to hear your others, and I look forward to the more and more collaboration for change. And I know, Melina, I made a, a mission. We're not welcoming Richard Neri Sue, but I know you'll go to him shortly for his motivation on the group and welcome Richard. So back to you, Melina. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'll pass it over next in alphabetical opposite line is Richard Florizone. And so happy to have your um, perspective here, Richard. Thanks, Melina. Thanks for having me here. Uh, look, at ISD, we talk about our ultimate vision is a world where people and a planet thrive. Uh, pretty straightforward, um, but also personal uh, to pick up on what others said. I think we have a responsibility to steward creation. I think when it comes to people, I think you've hold, heard some of our old, uh, some of us older folks here talk about uh, the responsibility we feel, feel to our kids or grandkids about creating a world for them. And I think even for our country and our communities, um, we've seen how in Canada we risk tearing our communities apart over pipeline debates and things like this instead of finding common ways forward to build a, a better future. I just want to add that on a personal note, it, there's an additional personal dimension for me. I, I grew up in uh, Treaty 6 territory, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, which where, where one of the final residential schools was. Um, uh, the, the one of the final ones closed in Canada. And so I remember those days and some of those fellow students and visiting those residential schools as a school kid. And so I see part of my responsibility as a Canadian, a leader to uh, do this work in light of reconciliation. Finally, I just wanna say that I'm here because of opportunity and excitement. And I'm gonna speak more to that in the next question, in, uh, but it's a little bit what Kim said when she opened. There is incredible uh, indigenous leadership on clean energy topics in Canada that we need to get behind and support and amplify and I'm looking forward to that conversation and doing my own part in amplifying that. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Richard. And I'll pass it over to Kathy um, from the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. Thank you for joining us, Kathy. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, uh, I, I worked for decades, so I guess I'm an OG as well. I, I worked with a cooperative insurance company. And I thought for those decades that I was with that organization, I've recently retired, that we were doing really noble work. We were doing noble work when it came to our identity as a cooperative and this democratically owned and controlled organization owned by other cooperatives in the country, actually including two indigenous cooperative organizations, Arctic Co-op and FCNQ in Quebec. Um, and, and so I was very proud of that work. Um, but as I watched the, the devastation that, that continued to occur as a result of you know, devastating weather events, and you know, we would go in and we would try to help communities to, to respond and recover and rebuild, I started to get this, this horrible sense that, that I wasn't part of contributing to well-being. I was actually, and my industry was part of perhaps masking, and we were part of the problem because we were masking to a large extent the, the implications of the changing climate. Um, and, and so, you know, it was that realization that we were looking at the issue far too narrowly. You can, we, we can't adapt our way out of what we're doing to our planet and what we're doing to our natural systems. It's not, that's not the right starting point. And that's where my starting point had been for far too long. Um, so when I came to that realization, on a personal note, I realized that I had to engage and contribute in a far more holistic way. And I had the fortune of being able to participate in a circle, not in this country, an Indigenous circle exercise. And this is where I have this. And I'm holding on to this as we speak. And it's an interconnected cue um, that is um, built by uh, wood that had been uh, chopped down in a forest that, that the local indigenous community, community had been fighting to try to prevent. Um, but they were able to, to obtain some of the, um, the, the wood that had been chopped and they made this as part of the exercise. So I'm holding on to this as my symbol today in this, it's this circle because it was that conversation that had me realize how much learning and unlearning I had to do and the guidance that I had to take from Indigenous knowledge. So I so look forward to being able to continue to participate in this conversation today. Thank you, Kathy. And I'm gonna 
ask Richard if you're okay to jump in on this and weigh in on this first question um, as somebody from community. And it, I don't know if you heard the first question, Richard. So I'll just say, what is your personal motivation? Um, how do you devote your talents and time to for the challenges of climate change? Um, I'm, I'm okay now. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. I, I think um, well, let's start first with um, I am and where I come from, and I think that'll get a sense of really where these things, my thoughts, my ideas come from. First of all, I come, I grew up in the Northwest Territories and Fort McPherson on the land. And uh, we're just talking not too long ago how we used to spend most of the winters in a tent at 60 below. You know, everybody's talking about housing in, in today's age and the modernization of our homes. And I think back to those days and how our uh, families uh, lived on the land and lived in those conditions on a regular basis. The other thing is that we lived in homes that um, were basically log homes that had wood stoves. And so you think about today's situation and the idea of modernization. And you think about where I came from riding in a dog team on the land. Um, that's where I came from. And so all of this conversation we're having about climatic change, it's very obvious to me from where I live and the impact and the consequence of climate change on the land and its impacts on the people and in the resources that we have. And so it's very visible. I mean, it's, it's amazing that, for instance, we don't have minus 60 below like we used to. We think minus Young people today think minus 40 is cold, but the reality is we used to live in conditions where it was minus 60. So you can see even within this last 50 years or so, the, the, the temperature changes in our climate is very, very significant. The length of our winters are shorter. The, we have more uh, humidity and it's very obvious with the hoar frost on our trees that we never used to have in the mid middle of winter. All of those changes have taken place. There's more humidity now. And so just in the kind of changes and the impacts on our, on our land, on our community and our families, we need to make the transition so that in this modern day, in this day, not, not even the modern day, in this day, moving forward, we have to realize that we have to make the appropriate changes to number one, protect the land, the environment, have an impact on reducing the consequence of climate change in our communities. And set, thirdly, uh, making the changes so that we're capable of having secure homes, um, living conditions that reduce our, our um, uh, requirements for diesel, for carbon fuels and that we can find new and better ways to, to keep our homes and take, to secure the energy in our communities. That's kind of why I'm, I'm involved in this exercise. Um, and so I'm glad I'm, I'm here, I'm part of the conversation and I, I thank you. Masi. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, yeah, it just reminds me, took me back home. I'm from, I'm not as far north as you, but I'm from Northern Alberta. And I heard my dad was hidden from residential school. And um, so he lived in on, you know, in all the tents on the land for growing up until he was, went into day school when he was 10. And I went, I lived in, my Cookman was somewhere on the horse and wagon. And so I've been on the horse and wagon and, you know, tented in, in the summer times on our territory, but not in the winter. I never, never braved that. So I just think I, but I hear of all the stories of my dad talking about, you know, how, how they had to brave the, the elements in such, you know, minus, 40, 50, 60 degree weather. And so, yeah, it's, thank you for that, bringing that element in, into a conversation of how, how Indigenous peoples have really survived and thrived 
on this land, um, pre-colonization and post. So hi, hi, thank you. I'm gonna move us on to the next question. Um, it is, is there one opportunity or is there one huge opportunity that can catalyze joint or combined indigenous clean energy and climate opportunities that you believe we collectively need to act with in urgency. And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go to you, Kathy, and go in that direction now. So if we can start with you, Kathy, that would be so great. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking about this question um, and, and the question was one huge opportunity. And I, you know, I, I thinking long and hard, I, I would say that, you know, our challenges are so complex and there, there's so much happening that is really exciting as well. Um, but there's, there's so much work to do. Um, so I, I, I couldn't come up with one huge opportunity. Perhaps my colleagues around this circle will, will be able to delve into specific uh, activities that, that might need more collective thought. Um, but what I will say by way of opening up you know, the, the perspectives of others is that I concluded that one of the uh, significant, I think, areas of focus is this concept of ensuring that we're learning from each other and that we're leveraging each other's work and that we're finding a way to ensure that, that we're able to support and encourage and continue to do what Ian was referring to in, in, in some of his commentary around, you know, every little bit helps and all of these projects that are underway are important and, and one size doesn't fit all. And communities need to have ownership and control and lead what is going to best work for them, but within the context of learning and connecting with each other. I think of one of the initiatives, Melina, that you're now involved in, um, that really speaks to that need for connectedness and coordination and cooperation and opening our hearts to learning from others and supporting others. Um, and so I would put a significant priority on continuing to drive formalize in some ways where they need to be formalized, but also support the informal relationships and connections that need to be able to support the work that we're all involved in in our own ways. Um, and, and I think that that formal informal uh, awareness that, that in fact we should be institutionalizing connections and communication vehicles, um, but, but just as importantly ensure that, that when we are doing our respective work and when we're in our respective areas of focus that we stay open and, and, uh, and understanding that there is so much underway and we do need to ensure that we're not replicating, duplicating, you know, repeating work that isn't necessarily needing to be repeated. So I, I'm here as part of an institute that is working very hard to make those connections and learn from and be able to contribute without necessarily repeating the efforts that are going on across the country that are, are in some ways unique to the community needs that exist, but in some ways have broader, more systemic learning that we can all benefit from. So I would hold that as my priority because I think it is a very complex and needs all of us to roll up our sleeves and continue to work. Thank you, Kathy. And I'll pass it over to Richard Florizone from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Mouthful, but here we go, Richard. Thank you, Melina. And yes, you can just call it IISD. Look, let me first echo what, what Kathy said, which is, uh, it reminded me of the words I remember uh, uh, Justice Marie, Senator Marie Sinclair always saying to me, and I think he was quoting Mar Marie Batiste at U of S about, you know, nothing about us without us. So, you know, relationships and working together have to be the core of this. But I'm going to stick my neck out and I'm just going to pick something very, very specific, then explain to you why. Here's, here's what I think I would put forward as my one initiative. And that is, it's very specific, so you'll laugh at me. Um, we need a $500 million investment in national indigenous clean energy action platforms. Now, don't I sound like a policy guy, but you should expect that from me. Um, that includes, we need financing uh, for microgrid systems, for off-grid diesel reduction, for community energy planning, for energy efficient infrastructure, et cetera. Let me give you the context for this because you're thinking, why is this guy mentioning this specific idea? Last year, I had the real pleasure and honor of chairing the Task Force for a Resilient Recovery, which was a collection of, of, uh, of, of industry and uh, First Nations voices, but think tanks and others on uh, giving advice to the government of Canada on how we should have a robust recovery from the pandemic, one that is inclusive and resilient and positive for the environment. And this is, Chris is probably nodding because this is how I got to know ICE and Indigenous Clean Energy, 
uh, and got to know Chris. And tying back to Kim's point about um, Indigenous people are already leading on this, I was uh, blown away, and so were members of that entire task force, just so impressed by the exciting Indigenous-led leadership in these important areas uh, that would lead to a better recovery from the pandemic and would lead to positive economic and environmental outcomes, specifically in buildings, in energy, and nature. And the point I wanna make is what's exciting about those ideas is not only are they already happening on the ground in indigenous communities, and not only are there grassroots proposals for further investment in those areas, but those areas align with the very best global thinking on what should be done for pandemic recovery. So I won't go into the great details, but you can look at Nobel economist Joseph Stiglitz and his colleagues at Oxford University. They did a study on the areas to invest and guess what? It was the ideas that came up from indigenous communities. It was investments in buildings, energy, and nature, these very ideas. So I picked specifically that one on clean energy action platforms, I, I suppose maybe because I, I just saw so much excitement there. Um, and I think there's such good work and it's coming from communities. I can see it contributing to reconciliation. I can see it con creating good jobs. I see that these indigenous led ideas are aligned with the very best Nobel winning ideas why wouldn't we do them? So that's my pitch. Thank you very much. I would have to agree with you, Richard. Um, Chris is next. And Chris also put in the, for all the people listening in right now, um, other participants listening to the conversation, he put, I wonder what huge Indigenous climate and clean energy opportunities participants would want to put out there. So feel free in the chat right now to um, put your perspective in. As Kathy said, it's all, it's all not just one. And so I'll pass it over to you, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Melina. I'm going to stay with my hockey puck because when I go to the rink, one of the things I love is listening to those voices of young people, children and youth playing hockey and enjoying themselves. So my huge opportunity is this. Could we walk the final step of reconciliation through Indigenous Clean Energy Partnerships? Could that be where we say and support young people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, Indigenous and allies, who then walk hand in hand together to take action to save our hockey rinks and save our planet and save our species? Because what I think we need to do is really embrace the collective, really embrace the together, our intentionality needs to be the intentionality of all. So the most huge opportunity, I think, is to welcome young Indigenous people and, and also young at heart Indigenous people along with their non-Indigenous counterparts to say, work together. This can only happen together. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And I'm gonna pass it over to you, Judith. Thanks, Melina. Yeah, I think as First Nations, we need to assert our authority and jurisdiction and do what we need to do in clean energy that works towards making climate change. We, there are many laws that face us across this country which put us as First Nations people back behind um, and especially here in British Columbia, we have uh, a very backward government that, that there is absolutely no economic opportunities for First Nations right now. So what, why do we need the government? Let's do what we need to do across this country to take control over energy, over the whole issue of climate change. And I think we have the ability to do so, but I also think that in order to do that, we really need to work together. You know, that's always been my dream is to come together as one voice in this province, in this country, to state what we want done and just do it. Um, let's not let these laws get in our way. Let's just go for it. And, you know, um, we need to be that one voice together because we're many voices across this country. And, you know, we don't tackle the federal government uh, as a whole. And I think we need to, it can be, it doesn't need to be an organization. It could be a coalition. It could be 
many forms that we all decide to work together. We hold one another up, we brainstorm, we work together, and we make the positive changes that we need to see in this world today. And, you know, I think that um, Indigenous leadership is definitely um, in climate change and clean energy is growing, but we need to make it a huge movement. It cannot just be one voice like Greta Thunberg. It's got to be all of us. And it's got to be from our young people to our elders and everyone in between. We need to come together as never before. Because, you know, the time is slipping away from us as we as we sit here talking and, you know, we've seen those changes and, you know, we've been left out of the economy. And, and so, you know, it's just time, I think, just to control the agenda and do what we need to do. And that's my big dream. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Judith. Yeah, I would agree. Sometimes we need those trailblazers to just go and do it and show the example before the policy or anything really actually exists. And I definitely have seen that in the example of, of what you did back in the early 2000s. So thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Ian. Well, thanks everyone for sharing your, your huge opportunities so far. I think there's some really, really positive things out there. Um, for those who know me, this probably comes as no surprise. The big opportunity I see is energy efficiency and housing um, in communities. And I, in, in classic Chris Henderson fashion, I, I say this for three reasons. Um, the first is the sort of kind of empirical climate impact side of things. You know, our, our built environment in Canada um, uh, accounts for about 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so A, there's a lot of work to do on homes that already exist. And B, if we keep building homes the way and, and buildings the way that we are building them, then we're just kind of ingraining ourselves into this carbon locked future without pivoting now. Um, the second one, actually two and three, really linked to this concept of healthy energy living that if you guys tuned into the panel uh, yesterday morning, we talked about at length with um, some communities from Fishing Lake, um, Red Rock Indian Band and, and Hillsick around um, this idea that energy efficiency can catalyze healthy energy living. And by that, I mean, um, the second point is healthy homes. So energy efficiency as a tool to achieve healthy homes from air quality, comfort, um, and also cost of living, reducing those utility bills for whether it's the individual um, home occupant or the community at large. Um, and the, the final piece to why I say energy efficiency, and this really took on a new meaning for me yesterday or a deeper meaning for me yesterday um, is around jobs and job creation through energy efficiency. Um, these are long-term jobs that are, they'll be that there's always work to be done to um, keep homes working effectively. And yesterday I was reading a news article that was called, I think it was jobs, one of the key links to deaths of despair. And so it was this research that was linking uh, a lack of jobs in indigenous communities to suicide rates. And so it, it really comes home now of this idea where, you know, if energy efficiency can be a means to create more jobs, then that final pillar of healthy energy living really takes on a deeper meaning. And that really struck a chord with me of, you know, I'd known about the job side before, and yes, it would be great to create more jobs, but that it could potentially have that sort of other impact um, really took it to a, a deeper level. And so, yeah, energy efficiency for climate reasons, for health reasons, and for living reasons. Um, that's, where I, that's where I go. I really agree with you, Ian. I feel like healthy homes is very much connected to suicide rates um, and, you know, how people feel in their home, how they feel inspired, how they feel like safe, how they feel um yeah just like comfortable and when you're not comfortable you're it's it's hard to feel focused and with the mold issues and everything and we we cover that um a part of this a smidgen of this in power to the people for the tv show in the new hulk nation and what they're doing there in terms of housing is just phenomenal so i would definitely yeah. encourage folks if you haven't seen that episode from power to the people please watch it it was so inspiring to be in that community mm -hmm. 
one, one of my favorite quotes, actually just quickly before passing on to Kim, um, Liana Humchit shares a quote that one of her hereditary chiefs, and I, I forget the name, his name right now, but um, he says, you know, our houses are our lenses to the world. And that, you know, when we have healthy homes, when we have the homes that affects how we see the world, and it's so true. Um, it really, really grounds us in all those things that you're sharing right now. Yeah, yeah, it really, it does. I mean, coming from a community that has, all, all Indigenous communities have these housing issues, but yeah, seeing that in in real life, it's a, it's shocking, I think, when I bring people home. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Kim yeah. and to conclude us in this, this round. Thanks, Melina. Um, there's a huge opportunity, I think, in making sure that we amplify the change in language around how our partners are supporting us. Uh, so the provincial and territorial governments are not all on the same playing field. There is the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of supporting Indigenous clean energy initiatives or energy efficiency initiatives. So I'd love to see a report card about who's doing what and how who is doing it well. So Ontario, for example, with the FIT program was a great a catalyst for Six Nations of the Grand River and other, other uh, communities in Ontario. So it would be ideal if uh, IISD or PEMINA or anybody uh, could have a provincial report card that shows who's doing what and who's doing it well. Uh, the other key opportunity I think we, we miss, and I've got here, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got cedar and I've also got the flowers of some sage. Uh, so the cedar is to cleanse and detoxify and heal and the sage as Algonquins would have it. Uh, you can't really see it all that well. Um, let me see if I can get a better picture of it. There we go. There it is. Um, this is love. And I, you know, we got to draw on ancestral power to help us because I think that all of the jumping around with financing and policy and whatever uh, might not be enough. We might need the the original gangsters on this and uh, let's draw on some ancestral power. So anybody who's got, uh, you know, a close connection to the land, go out there, ask, ask for our ancestral power to help us through this. Thanks, Melina. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I feel like that's one thing that I love about being a Catalyst 2020 and being a part of the Indigenous Clean Energy Network is that we do make those connections when we're in gatherings and have the elders and have people pray and you know in our languages and share songs and like Ian said the drum I have one of those drums and I'm so I felt so honored to receive one of those drums um back in the day and actually I'm going to bring Richard back in Neri Sue for a community perspective if you're okay sorry we keep um but yeah it's what what do you think is one huge opportunity that um communities can do to to address um, climate change? Well, I, I would say this, you know, um, none of what we're able to do cannot happen without governments changing the way they deal with Indigenous people. We have really excellent leadership in this country when it comes to uh, the idea of developing uh, proposals, ideas, concepts for Indigenous people to address climate change and energy e efficiency, energy use, energy development. We have all kinds of, of uh, ability to do those things. What we don't have is the, the policy and the legislative changes that are necessary to allow us to, to get on our way and do the things we need to do. There are too many restrictions, too many roadblocks, all coming from the idea of monopolies, um, bad policy or no policy that encourage and support Indigenous initiatives, whether or not it's energy efficiency, whether or not it's um, development of renewable energy projects, uh, all of those things that cause as um, uh, issues around moving forward. Because in my view, right now, Indigenous communities, leaders, are in fact leading this process in Canada. 
but we have these stumbling blocks that are in our way to not only lead Canada, but to be the example for the rest of the world for Indigenous people. And we need to, we, I have all the faith in the world in our Indigenous leadership, and I'm talking not solely in, in terms of the political leadership, but in the innovative thinking of our people and those that can lead these projects and lead these ideas. And I think that we can find ways to get rid of the barriers and the limitations on our ability to move forward. I think that's in our interest to do that. And we'll, we'll find the solutions, we'll be the leaders, but we need people to get out of our way. And that's, that's easier said than done because people are very reluctant to give away what they think or they feel is their, their power. And always power is important. And in this case, it's about indigenous power. 100% agree, Richard. I And I love using the Indigenous Clean Energy stats because the stats actually, you know, back up a lot of what, of what you're saying of there's over 2,300, 2,300 small to medium scale renewable energy projects that are Indigenous led across this country and just under 200 large revenue generating scales led by Indigenous communities across this country. And I think people are surprised when they hear that stat when I, when I talk about it. And it just shows that there's the ingenuity innovation that Indigenous leaders are doing this work, regardless of the support of local governments, municipalities, um, a lot of times federal governments, and sometimes with that support. Um, so I think it, you know, it depends on the, the difference of the community. From my community, we, we built the solar project just out of, you know, fun, I was fundraising, it, there, was, there wasn't there was government support at the time when we built our solar project. So, um, and then that policy came into existence for a while and then now it's gone in Alberta. But, um, you know, I think it's, it shows that people are taking the onus and leadership from their own nations. They know the problems, so therefore they know the solutions. And I think that's a part of what just excites me about Indigenous clean energy initiatives. And I'm gonna send it over to you, um, Who's no, that's it. We're on the third and final question, but I know Kim's going to be starting this this round. So the final question is, um, I invite each panelist to do one of two things. Um, well, recognize positive clean energy climate action by an Indigenous person or community. So that's one. And then also in your um, report back or in your, um, this is the last question for you, but um, offering Indigenous clean energy participants a positive gift of a resource or a program or any kind of support for people doing Indigenous clean energy projects and climate action. And so we'll start with you, Kim, and I'll put the question in, in the chat box just so um, everyone has it. Thanks, Melina. Um, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Troy Jerome and Terry Lynn Morrison, um, because they initiated and led a, in a, on a very bumpy road, uh, their own communities towards a large wind farm in Listigush in, a, in an arguably challenging provincial environment where, uh, and they created a profitable uh, wind resource for their communities. Um, and it wasn't easy. So, it's one thing to do it in a climate where you have a lot of support. It's a whole other thing where you have to pull every string and manage every curve and turn around a really narrow and winding mountainous road to do it. Uh, so I want to acknowledge them as being true leaders. Uh, the other thing I think we need to do is look broadly and to the international community uh, I would say that if, if you haven't already, study the German example of community ownership of clean energy projects. So it's great to have uh, absentee owners and partners in renewable energy projects for communities, but the economic benefits of community ownership are three times as great. Uh, so the Germans have done this extensively. And I would say if we, if we can't find a similar model domestically, um, I'm sure the Germans would be happy to share their knowledge and expertise with us. So over to you, Ian. Uh, 
Sorry, it's just adding adding to Molina sharing sharing. I think Chris, you and I were obviously on the on the same line. Um, folks in the audience, you know, share your own um, recognition and, and shout outs to folks um, just to make that love heard across the country. Um, or if you have gifts to offer, I encourage you to share those in the chat too. Um, for me, I want to give a shout out to the guy communities I've been working with over the past year uh, through bringing it home. You know, we, we tried to launch this last year and right into COVID we hit. And that caused a big shift in how we had to do things and, and how we had to adapt, um, but also made it really challenging for them at a community level to have these discussions while there were all these other bigger, more pressing, urgent issues to happen. But the, the community leaders out there, Leona, Leon, Melissa, um, Alex, and, and Kyla, you know, they just kept pushing through and they kept grinding and they're continuing to work because they see, um, they see the importance and they have that deep set um, personal interest in seeing this move forward. Um, so I want to give a big shout out to them for um, grinding through the last year. And, and I'm really excited to see where things go from here as we, as we keep um, moving energy efficiency forward in, in those communities. I think I'm over to, to Judith then. It is, yeah. Thank you. There are so many wonderful projects uh, in action um, here within British Columbia. I think back in 2003, when we commissioned, Hoopachesset commissioned our Run of the River project, we were one of the early projects. Um, but today, like, there's just so many. And you know, they're from Run of the River, geothermal, solar, and you see the wonderful involvement of members in solar, you know, Haida Gwaii bringing in their youth and putting their paintings on it. Um, Slaywatuth in the middle of Vancouver, North Vancouver, having a beautiful solar array. You know, there's just so many clean energy projects. And, you know, I want to give a shout out to the BC Clean Energy Initiative, um, which provides funding to some of these projects. And we're really lobbying governments to get more money because we're running out of uh, uh, running out of that money but you know I was I was thinking as I was listening to the rest of the speakers you know I get so so very tired of spending you know 90 percent of my time fighting governments to get money to get programs to get them to support us you know but I look at the other side and it just that's one of my motivations is just seeing these wonderful projects and people's reactions we had huge forest fires here in British Columbia a couple of summers back and what did First Nations do? They sat down and they put in place plans to fight that because the impacts in our community were huge. I mean, they can't even hunt in their forests for many years. Uh, you know, it's so it's that action, I think, is to say, OK, you know, we cannot be left powerless here. We need to do something. And, you know, it's it's fires and floods and all of the impacts of climate change that is causing us to act, to prepare, to be ready. And, you know, this pandemic caught us off guard. We weren't ready. We need to be ready for the next big ones. And so I think for me, it's that positive getting organized in our communities that I, you know, I just, it's hard for me to just say one, one First Nation or one project because there's just so many of them here and across the country. You know, Marina is one of the leading solar in, in Alberta. I mean, there's some awesome stuff that has happened, um, but I'm just excited to see that we can put our energy into accomplishing things while still having to battle. Um, and I'm sure we'll do that for many years to come, but you know, it's the positive accomplishments that drives me further that we can hold it up to government and say, look what we're doing. Uh, and then um, try and get support for doing more. So. Thank you for the time. I forgot that um, I was supposed to show you um, something that's important to me. And, and like Kim, you know, I got, I keep cedar in my house, of course, cedar. Um, and I talked about old growth in the beginning of my presentation. And the health of the old growth forest shows me what's happening on the ground with the climate and the need to retain that old growth for all of our spiritual purposes and cultural purposes and many, many things. And so, you know, when I see these projects happening, I know everybody is contributing 
in our language, it's Hishikish Sawak. Everything is connected, everything is one. So these projects across the country all help towards the bigger goal that we all have, and that's maintaining this world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. I'm gonna pass it over to Chris because we're coming up to the top of the hour. And thank you so much, yes, for your wise words, Judith. Judith, always I feel like I need sunglasses, but I'm gonna pass it over to Chris. There's a place up in Northern Quebec on the shores of Hudson Bay called Inukjuak. And for 14 years, I've been helping them to reduce their diesel with the hydro project. It's taken us 14 years to do that. But due to the leadership of the Inuit community and the Land Holding Corporation, they are now doing that, which will reduce 100% of all diesel used for heat and for water and space heating. So that's my positive recognition for the perseverance and the power of the people, very much as Melina, your TV series, Power to the People. The perseverance of the community of Anukchuak, the Inuit community, I recognize them. And my positive gift, well, I only give me, as long as the creator gives me time and energy to help you, I will always be there for Indigenous clean energy. I will take it. Your your presence is such a gift, Chris. I'm so happy that you um, are part of this network and that you share your wealth of experience as a young Indigenous person. I've always so appreciated that and your willingness to really share um, all that you know. And so it's so it's so great. So I'm going to pass it over to Richard from IISD. Sorry, slow on my mute button. Look, thank you um, to answer both questions. First, in terms of recognition, when I thought about this question beforehand, I thought I, it's it's ice. I really want to recognize. I want to recognize that everyone's work, uh, people on this panel. But I've got. I suppose I've gotten to know Chris and Ice the best over the past year, and and just really impressed. And and I want to do what I can do to support it, which le leads to my second point about the positive gift. I hope you don't mind me sharing. You asked to share a, an object and I do this with all humility, uh, but what came to mind for me was uh, an eagle feather that uh, Chief uh, Rufus Kopej, Chief of the Sibilakadi Band in the Mi'kmaq Nation uh, um, presented me with when I was president of Dalhousie University in Halifax. And uh, I, that just, I guess it reminded me of that, maybe that obligation of leadership. And, and I guess my offer is just to try to act as a leader in ISD, as Chris said, to offer myself as a force multiplier and an advocate, uh, whether it's continuing to work as we have, Chris, uh, to advocate for these investments as we, has, as we have with Ottawa, and we've gotten a good voice there. Kim, your idea of a report card, let's talk about that. Um, but to kind of achieve the change we all want to see. Thank you very much. And I want to uh, final uh, one final thing. Melina, I know you've been dodging the sun but in the chat people have been saying how great it was to see the sun right on your face it was lovely so thank you yes i didn't mind actually i was like yay i finally get some vitamin d out here in the rainy west coast so i my body is taking it um i just can't see fully um so i'm gonna pass it over it sounds it seems like we are coming to the end of our conversation but not it would be remiss to bring in kathy here from cicc and um yeah round us off and give us your final thoughts Okay, well, I, I will be brief and respect the, uh, the end of our time. Um, look, I, I am just so grateful and uh, that, that we have, as we built out this institute, such fantastic uh, support and contribution and wisdom and guidance from the Indigenous leadership that's come to the Institute to help us figure out why we exist and how we add value. And there are too many to name. Melina, you're one of them. Um, and there are so many others that I, I just wouldn't be able to in the time that we have. So I, I just want to, to provide this, this aggregated, uh, you know, heartfelt bone deep uh, sense of gratitude for the guidance that we're getting. And, and the gift is that I'm going to continue to, to, to continue to personally and organizationally commit as Richard has outlined, to, to amplifying and to being um, able to support um, and highlight and tell the stories of the leadership uh, and the initiatives that are going on. We have a number of projects underway right now that are Indigenous-led initiatives that are, are so critically important to the work of the Institute. And my personal and organizational commitment is to continue to find those opportunities um, to be able to, to engage with, to amplify, to support the incredible leadership that the Indigenous communities across this country are, are, are showing. So I'll end there. 
Hi, hi. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and so I was asked to do a prayer or a song, but for where I'm from, I usually ask my elders. So I'm going to ask Richard and Neri Sue to find to give to give us your final thoughts. And um, if you're okay, a final prayer or just any words of recognition for Kichi Manitu, our creator and all creation. So if that's okay, Richard, I would give you tobacco. So I'm giving you virtual tobacco here. <laughs> and hi, hi. I'm reaching out. To um. You know, I, I'll say this. Um, you know, there are so many people that we are we have to be grateful for. People that are on this panel right now that have done really good things. I mean, uh, Melina, I was just looking at all the things that you've done in terms of promoting promoting um, clean energy. Uh, Ian, in terms of engaging with Indigenous communities and making a difference and uh, Judith and uh, Chris Henderson being part of the leadership and the policy changes that are necessary. The, the people that are on this panel now, but in our communities, there are incredible people. You know, last few days, Grant Sullivan from the Gwich'in community has been given recognition. My friend, um, Chief um, Tija, you know, out of uh, Van Tut Old Crow. And I, I just wanted to share this with you. This is made on a caribou antler and it's got a feather on it. And of course that's um, beautiful art, Tufty. Who's here? Tufty. This is part of our food. The last few days, um, for many years, the um, Gwich'in have been fighting against um, the development of oil and gas in the calving grounds of the Porcupine Cabin Herd. And the reason is protection of our food and food security. It's not against the idea that natural resources should not be used. It's that natural resources should be used in a responsible way while protecting the well being of our people. And so the idea when Biden signed the um, executive order to protect the 1002 lands and the porcupine caribou herd, that's a big thing in our communities. And so I wanted to show you this. I wanted to say to you all that, you know, the creator, creator is as good as we want the create, creator to be for us if we live, live according to the guidelines and the rules of the creator. This land was given to us, all its resources, all the food we get from it, all the bounty is, is a result of the creator taking care of us. And as indigenous people and as people of the world, we have a responsibility to take care of this earth as well for future generations, even today's generations, because many of the things we were fortunate to be able to take care of, we are not able to allow our children to, to, take, to take out of the land and out of the waters, the things we used to be able to take. And that is because of the abuse of our lands and our waters and our environment. And so I hope that the creator will give all of you good guidance, wisdom, and generosity uh, of good spirit and kindness to your community and to your people. Thank you very much. Hi, hi. Thank you for your wise words, Richard, and your kind words and reminder of connecting to spirit. I am going to connect it back to Ryan, our MC for this week and thank you so much so 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 much for every single panelist that took time from your busy schedule to share your wise words and your knowledge and your experience um thank you such an amazing closing plan plenary an amazing way to end the week and so i'm just so grateful to be part of this network i love indigenous clean energy and all of the people that work there and so i'll pass it over to you ryan and thank you so much for listening to us today hi hi panelists oh Awesome. Thanks, Melina. And beautiful words, Richard. Um, use those to help guide, guide uh, my day today in the work that I'm doing. What a great panel, everyone. You can hear the passion in everyone's voice. You're all making a difference. And I thank you for, for that from the 
bottom of my heart. Um, the one thing that I took out was when you're asked what everyone's personal motivations are to address global uh, climate change. A lot of you said, whether it was children, the youth, your communities, the future generation, or uh, having just a healthy earth. So I encourage all of you to, when the days get hard, when doing this work that you do, I encourage you to remember your why. And that'll, I, that'll help you push through and help you make the change that you're trying to make in this world. And like you said, we need to work together and we can only do this together. And with that, I will close this session and we're gonna jump into the next session, but we're gonna be using Zoom. So there might be about a five minute lag. So we're gonna jump out of here and then jump into our next session. See you all there.